This video investigates the frame dragging effects of the Kerr space time upon particles and photons in the region of a rotating mass of a rotating black hole. It then deals with the different definitions for the existence of stationary limit surfaces and event horizons. So given a rotating black hole of mass M that is uniformly rotating, we can use photons to probe the space-time outside this mass. Now the line element in Boyer-Lindquist coordinates is, as found in previous videos, this object here, and we can write that in terms of GTT and so on, GT phi, and the differentials of each of the coordinates, C dt, d phi, dr squared, d theta squared, d phi squared, um, and we have almost diagonal except for this one term here. Now here rho squared is r squared plus a squared cos squared theta and delta is a squared plus r squared minus 2 gm r on c squared and we notice that r approaches infinity as gtt approaches minus 1. So this term here goes to minus 1 as R approaches infinity, asymptotically approaches um, negative one, the whole thing here. So that R becomes uh, rho squared, which is made up R squared plus A squared cos theta, is larger than R, and it becomes a dominating term for large R, and forces this towards zero, and we're left with just minus one, okay? And we expect all here, same thing here, um, rho squared here is made up of r squared, dominating term over the r above, and eventually sending this down towards zero. Um, same over here. And we approach the Minkowski metric of flat space time asymptotically. All right, now let's consider the case of a photon released at a fixed distance from the rotating black hole or the rotating mass. I'm just going to say in these videos the mass rather than black hole all the time, such that dr equals zero equals d theta, so it's fixed, uh, in, and in both the plus and minus phi directions. So we're going to release this photon in the same direction as the mass is rotating, and also attempt to um, release it in the direction against the rotation, so in the direction of the counter rotation, and we'll see what happens. So initially only dt and d phi are non-zero initially. All right, the path of a, of a photon follows ds squared, so our line element becomes, remember d theta and dr was set to zero. So you can imagine a spaceship holding a position uh, outside the black hole and releasing a photon in the direction of rotation and also attempting to release one in a direction counter to the rotation. All right, so next thing here is we divide through by c squared dt squared, and it gives us this quadratic looking object here, which we can solve using quadratic formula. d phi c dt gives us this object here, which you can tidy up a little bit of algebra, and we get this. All right, now, so d phi over c dt is this object here. Now, if we set gtt, as um, the time component, the line element to zero, and we get d phi c dt. So if that bit there is zero, then we get minus this plus or minus this object here. Okay, in the case of minus, we'll have two lots of them, and in the case of plus, they'll cancel out to zero. Now, this first solution describes the photon that was sent off in the same direction as that of the rotating mass. So d phi c dt is minus two gt phi over g phi phi. So gt phi is this object here, and g phi phi was this one, okay? We have the minus out here, okay? And um, this was actually two times this object here. Um, remember we got two of them in the metric. There's one at t phi and one at phi t. So two times two there gives us this object here. Okay, now you notice here the minus and the minus cancel out, and so that every part of this is positive, so the whole object is greater than zero. 
So what that's saying is the photon that was sent off in the same direction as rotation of the mass is rotating in the same direction and is rotating in the positive direction, which is anti-clockwise looking above from the z-axis. And you can see this entirely rotates in the same direction. All right, the second solution describes what happens to the photon launched in the opposite direction to that of the rotating black hole and shows just how strong is the frame dragging effect. The photon in this case is unable to move, which means all particles with mass and traveling at less than the speed of light also cannot move in this direction. So if light close to the black hole here is released and cannot rotate or counter rotate with respect to the black hole, then neither can any object that possesses mass and so travels at less than the speed of light. Okay, and we can see here, just looking above from the positive z-axis looking down, we can see how space-time itself is twisted as we come close to the mass. Further away, asymptotically becomes flat space, but close in becomes very twisted. And so anything, any object releasing, any photon, uh, must rotate with the mass, it can't rotate against it. So any spaceship in this region releasing a mass close to the um, black hole, uh, releasing a photon or a particle, no matter what initial angular momentum or energy they give it, it simply must rotate with the black hole um, and cannot do otherwise. All right. From the line element, we can see that outside the mass, GTT is less than zero, it's negative in this region, and as you move further and further away from the mass, it asymptotically approaches minus one. So it remains negative outside the mass always. Any particle with mass or an observer who wish to remain at a fixed distance from the rotating mass can do so with the four velocity given by, okay? So the four velocity here, this is something that spatially remains fixed, position, it's not moving, there's only the time component to the four velocity. Now outside here, far enough away from the mass, this uh, still satisfies the condition u dot u is minus c squared, so normalizing the four vector squared is, or the norm of the four vector squared is minus c squared, so u dot u is gtt, this here minus this object here, GTT is that object here times that, and we see that's equal to minus C squared. So outside the rotating mass, this can still be satisfied, so, so long as you're sufficiently far away. When GTT equals zero, we have the condition for a surface. Just think about um, vector algebra and so on, a function of various coordinates equal to zero specifies a surface. And the Schwarzschild geometry, this same condition, gave us the location of the event horizon or surface of infinite redshift for some given mass m and for the Schwarzschild geometry r was 2gm on c squared. Um, now in this case an event horizon and surface of infinite redshift or stationary limit surface coincide, they're one and the same thing. That doesn't always have to be the case but here we were able to find that the Schwarzschild coordinate here, okay, now it's not a real physical singularity as we've seen in previous videos, it's just a coordinate singularity. All right. In an axisymmetric space-time, so you've got a rotating one about say the z-axis or something, time, these two surfaces need not be the same. So a stationary limit surface and the event horizon will see are not the same. Another name for an infinite redshift surface is stationary limit surface, so Think of infinitely redshifted photons, hence infinite redshift surface. On this surface, GTT is zero, but inside it, GTT is greater than zero, and the condition for a particle with mass to remain stationary on or within it cannot be fulfilled. Now, perhaps I could have given an example here, but inside, um, we would find that this becomes positive, and the norm of the four four velocity vector u dot u is this object here. Now since this is positive times, and this is definitely positive, then it cannot equal negative c squared. And so this condition cannot be satisfied. So a mass within this surface cannot remain stationary. An event horizon has the interesting property that it is a null surface that involves the use of null vectors. 
These null vectors are normal to the surface at every point on it, and we can use these null vectors to actually define the surface. Okay, so given some surface defined by f of x mu, these are the coordinates, equals zero. Okay, think of vector algebra. Um, setting all this equal to zero, okay, gives you, specifies a surface. Now, a normal vector to this surface is then given by n is n mu contravariant, e nu, that's a tangent basis, is um, g mu nu del mu f e nu, or in component form, n mu, lower here, is del f mu. Now, this is a one form, and it's in the dual basis. Notice the lowered component here as opposed to the upper component. And uh, my apologies, I shouldn't have done that. Um, whereas here, we use the inverse metric to raise this component so that we get a contravariant component. And so our vector is expressed in the tangential basis. Okay. But if we have a look at just this part here, del mu f mu, we get a one form, which is a lowered index, and mu is this object here. Now, uh, f is a scalar, so its covariant derivative is the same as its partial derivative. Um, and so that's why we can do that here, but only here, only in the case of a scalar. Now, a null vector has zero magnitude, so magnitude squared which is, okay, so magnitude is mod n, but we'll just square the magnitude, it's just easier and convenient and easier to look at, is n dot n is n mu e mu dot n mu e mu, notice these are on a tangential basis, and that's uh, g mu nu n mu n mu is zero, and this means a null vector is perpendicular to itself, and so it is also tangential to the surface it defines. Notice for this to be zero, then n mu n mu must also be perpendicular to themselves. Now, if this is normal to the surface, then perpendicular means tangential to the surface. All right. So this vector is um, tangential to the surface and normal to the surface because of this condition here where the magnitude squared is zero. All right. So that means these two vectors must be perpendicular. So it's normal to the surface and tangential to the surface. All right, so the components of this normal four vector to the surface and their relationship, the ordinary derivative is once again, n mu, subscript mu, covariant mu is df dx mu, so it's a one form. And that implies that the total differential df is df dx mu dx mu is, and remember this bit is n mu n mu dx mu, okay? Now, n mu dx mu, just working backwards, normally we work from the right to the left, but now we're gonna work from the left to the right to recover the relationship between them. So n mu dx mu is g mu nu n nu dx mu is e nu, definition of the metric here, is e nu dot e mu in the tangential basis, n mu dx mu, okay, and that gives us the vector n mu e mu dot dx mu e mu, so it's expanding in the tangential basis, so we've gone from the scalars here to the vector form here, is n dot dx, just working backwards. Now, dx here is tangential to the surface, all right, and we know that n is normal to the surface and tangential to the surface. So that what we can say then is that this line element in the surface df, now just the time component suppressed here, I'm using the spatial part to demonstrate the point, but remember these are four vectors, and but the time component is suppressed, all right? And just for pedagogical reasons, it's convenient to express these on the surface like this. So dx or n is this vector here, they're both the same thing, and it's magnitude, df, it's line interval, it's length increment df is n dot dx, because both these are tangential to the surface. All right. All right, both of these four vectors, n mu and, and the one form uh, dx mu, are tangential to the surface and belong to the same vector space at each point p on the surface. So there's a point p, has its own unique vector space, 
and we have dx and n in that vector space only. As components dx1, n1, dx2, n2, dx3, n3, this is just the spatial part, just to give you something to visualize. If these two vectors are also parallel to each other, dx nu parallel to n nu, then the relation g nu nu uh, inverse, contravariant, the inverse metric terms, and the um, one form components, n mu, n mu, is uh, working that out. Uh, raise the index on one, so we get n nu, n nu, and we get n nu dx nu, because remember these are parallel to each other. Um, and we found they were the same, equals df equals zero. Okay, now a zero interval length tells us that the element of length in a surface is df equals zero is null. So it's a null length. Now in 4D space time, the distance traveled by light is zero, ds squared is zero. So we have df is n nu dx nu equals ds squared is zero. The entire surface, in other words, is a null surface. And this means the null surface is tangent to the light cone at each and every point on it. And we'll see a diagram later on showing that with light cones. So the null surface is tangent to the light cone at each and every point on it. Furthermore, at each point on this surface, the local light cone lies entirely on the interior side of the surface. I'll show you a diagram of that later with its normal vector to the surface pointing inwards. Okay can't point outwards, all of which means that the future directed world lines of particles and photons can only cross this surface in one direction only, not the other way. Since these particles can only cross in one direction, this surface forms an event horizon. So if photons and particles with mass can only cross a surface in one particular direction, in one direction only, inwards, uh, and not come out the other way, you then have an event horizon. And that all rests on df, the little line interval in this surface, equals ds squared equals zero. All right. So if we have a look at space-time diagram, ct r, r equals zero, the real physical singularity in here, the coordinate singularity of Schwarzschild radius, r is 2 gm on c squared. And notice the light cones, they close up as we get closer and across the surface. And notice the event horizon or null surface here. This is Schwarzschild black hole. This is the null surface here, the event horizon. The light cone tangent to an interior to the event horizon with its normal to the null surface pointing inwards. So here's the surface of the light cone. It's tangential to the, um, to the uh, Schwarzschild event horizon and the normal points inward. Any particle having crossed this line is never coming out again. It's heading towards the singularity. Having crossed the event horizon, the particle can only move in one direction towards the singularity at r equals zero. All right. In a static symmetric space-time, such as the Schwarzschild case, the surface must be defined by an equation in the form f equals f bar is r squared minus a squared um, equals zero. Then a normal to this surface is given by n is g mu nu del f del mu of f e nu uh, is g mu nu d mu. Again, we go from the covariant to the partial derivative because f is a scalar. Is that? And we get the only case here, there's only r's involved, g r r d r f e r. Now it's magnitude squared is mod n squared n dot n uh, is g mu nu. Uh, n mu, n nu, two indices lower, two indices upper here. If we expand that out, the only ones given f, there's no other coordinates in there, is grr, drf, drf. Okay, remember we found n mu earlier to be drf, n nu, drf. Okay, and we get grr is drf all squared is zero. Solving this, so this equation here is equal to zero implies that GRR contravariant is zero. The inverse metric term for the R coordinate, GRR is zero or DRF squared is zero. So given the event horizon at 
GRR is this object here equals zero, or R equals the familiar Schwarzschild radius. And the singularity at, just work this bit, the RF, the R of that is 2R squared equals zero implies R equals zero. So there's our singularity at R equals zero. In an axis symmetric space time, the equation of the surface can still take the form f equals f of r with normal vector again, n is g mu nu, d mu f e nu, grr, because there's only a function of r here, dr f e r, whose magnitude is mod n squared is again the same thing. Working that through, this object is zero. And again, this grr is zero, or this bit in the parentheses squared is zero. All right. We don't have an explicit form for the equation of the surface, but there are still other quantities that can be found. The inverse metric term is GRR is delta on rho squared. Okay. The square of the magnitude of the normal vector is now mod n. That is that. Let's put things in. GRR is as we found delta on rho squared, which we saw earlier what they are how they're defined is that and so we need this equals zero implies uh, multiply through by rho squared means that implies that delta itself is zero and that means delta is this object here equals zero and rho squared is r squared plus a squared cos squared theta does uh, not equal to zero Okay, in the next video we'll use these results to determine the location of stationary limit surfaces and event horizons. Okay, now to summarize, in an axisymmetric space time, a stationary limit surface or a surface of infinite redshift occurs when GTT is zero. Okay, in the Schwarzschild and Kerr geometries, event horizons occur when GRR equals zero. Just notice this event horizon also occurs when GTT is zero um, in the Schwarzschild case. But in the Kerr case, in the Kerr geometry, these two things will be separate and different surfaces, uh, which is why I separate them here. In the Schwarzschild case, it doesn't matter. They'll both give you the um, event horizon or stationary limit surface, and they're both the same thing. But in the Kerr geometry, a stationary limit surface or surface of infinite redshift is a different thing to an event horizon. And in the next video, we'll look at the structure of a Kerr black hole. Okay, that's it.